And now finally, we're concluding objective one by talking about mathematical model involving joint variation. Joint means we're gonna have a couple of variables together. So um, I'm just gonna lay it out for you. So each one of these things are equivalent. So the first one is Z is jointly proportional to X and Y. So here you've got three variables total and Z is, do, is jointly proportional to two others, uh, X and Y. So let's see what that means. So over there on the left hand side, v vary, or Z varies jointly with X and Y, means the same thing as jointly proportional. And the way that I write the equation is it kind of looks like direct variation, just with another variable being multiplied. So z is equal to a times x times y, where a is the constant variation. And just like you see down at the bottom there, is that you can have each one of those variables, x and y, raised to some other power. It doesn't have to be just to the first power. And the other thing is, well, for joint variation, it doesn't have to be just two variables. It could be to three other variables. So for example, I could say that W varies jointly with X, Y, and Z, for example. There you go. All right. So um, let's apply this one. The variable Z is jointly proportional to X and Y. So I'm going to write myself an equation like this. Z is jointly proportional to X and Y. So jointly proportional, it's, it's very similar to directly proportional, it's just you, know, you got another variable that you have to multiply in there. So let's put in all the numbers that it gives us. Z is equal to seven, not a Z equals Z. Z equals A times X is one and Y is two. So I get seven equals two A and A equals seven halves. There's the constant of variation. My equation is y equals not y. Habit. Habit. Z equals seven halves xy. Could you have put 3.5 in there? Sure. Could you have put 2.5 in there? No, because that's not the same. Anyway, Last part of this, z is equal to, or what is z equal to when x is equal to negative two and y is equal to five? So z equals negative seven halves times negative two. Was it negative seven halves? Where did that negative come from? No clue. Times five. Okay, now this two down here can cancel with that two. Don't forget I still have a negative sign up there. And then I have the five. So 7 times negative 1 times negative 5 is negative 35. Easy. Okay, now um, on the previous examples, we were looking at table of values. When it was direct variation, if we divided the numbers, we always got the constant of variation. And inverse variation, if we multiplied the two numbers together, we got the constant of variation. Now there isn't one really for joint variation because now we've got a couple extra variables and things get a lot more complicated then. So we're not going to have a shortcut for us just looking at a table of values and seeing if it was joint, jointly, if it varied jointly or not. Okay. All right, we're almost done with this one. So maximum load that can safely be supported by a horizontal beam is jointly proportional to the width of the beam and the square of its depth and inversely proportional to the length of the beam. Huh. Let's write it all down. So I'm going to say maximum load. Let's just say that this is ML. Okay, maximum load. Maximum load is equal to, now it says that it is jointly proportional to the width. Underline it there, jointly proportional to the width and the square of the depth. So I need a constant of variation in here. We'll call that A. The width, w, and the depth squared. So d squared jointly means that I'm multiplying them. And inversely proportional to the length of the beam. It's called length l, that makes sense. And I have to divide by that l. Fancy l looks like it's cursive. So there's the equation. I don't know what the a value is without specific numbers, but that's not what this question is about. 
this question is about now once I have that equation like if I change one of the quantities how does it change something else how does it change the maximum load so the first one what if the width of the beam doubles so if I put in a 2 for W what happens to the whole thing so let me let me just write this right up here so if I put in a times 2w times d squared all over L. Now let's compare that to the first one. What's the only difference? The only difference is that there's a 2 in here, so this means that the maximum load is 2 times bigger. So it also doubles, so maximum load doubles. If you double the width, you double the load that it, that beam can carry. Let's look at the second one. The depth of the beam doubles. So I'm going to change colors here. How about green? And um, let's get rid of the stuff that came before it. All that stuff. Go back to the pen. And this time the, de the depth doubles. So I have A times W times 2D squared. And the parentheses there are important because now I have to square that out. And that is A times W times 4D squared over L. Now compare this to the original one. I can see that it is four times bigger than the original, so it quadruples. So the maximum load quadruples. If you double the depth, so that's how fat that thing is, right? It, it makes it way, way stronger than if you just make it wider. That's what it's saying. Okay, and the last one, the length of the beam doubles. What's that going to do? Uh, up here, where are you? Here, let me just call it that. There we go. And uh, let's change this one to maybe red and erase all of this again. Okay, and we want the length of the beam to double this time. So A times W times D squared over 2L. So now compare this to the other one. Is it two times as big? No, we're dividing by two. We're dividing by two means that it's half as big. So the maximum load halves. It gets cut in half. Does that make sense? If you if you make your beam twice as long, it's not as strong anymore. It's more like bow in the middle. So I can get all that information just from looking at the equation. So that's pretty handy there. Okay, last one. Write a sentence using variation terminology for the volume of a cone. So variation terminology. When you see this on your homework or whenever you see this on a quiz, what this means is I'm saying is it directly proportional or is it inversely or is it jointly? That's what I'm talking about. So take a look at the equation. The volume of a cone, a right circular cone, is one-third pi r squared h. The first thing to realize about this is that the one-third pi doesn't change. No matter what you stick in for the height, no matter what you stick in for the radius, those things don't change, which means that that part is the constant of variation. So it's like our a value. Even though it has a little pi there, that usually throws some people. But don't worry about it. One third pi doesn't change. That's the constant of variation. So now look at the two variables that we have. We've got the r and we have the h. And they're being multiplied together. There's two variables that are being multiplied together. That is joint variation. So I'm going to say that the volume varies jointly with these two. So the volume. Oh, fail. Volume varies jointly. Underline that there. Uh, with the height and the radius squared, or the square of the radius. With the height and the square and the the square. Oh, come on, come on, get it together of the radius. Now you might be wondering 
why I switched the height and the radius around. Does it matter? No. But I think it sounds better whenever you read it off. The height and, oh, that's what was missing there. There should have been an and. Okay, and the square of the radius, rather than the square of the radius and the height. Anyway, sounds better to my ear. So that concludes objective one. Finally, this last part was about joint variation. Joint variation is very similar to direct, except we have an additional variable that we're multiplying together. All right, stay tuned for objective two.